Good morning, everyone. Hi, everybody. Good Palm Sunday to you. All over the world today, Christians are celebrating the arrival of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem so that he can prepare and be prepared to um, be sacrificed for all of us. Uh, next Sunday will be Easter Sunday. So we're glad you're here with us this morning. Amen. Barb and I are, are prepared to, uh, to bring a great word to you today. We hope that uh, you are well and safe in your home. We've been praying for you and praying Psalms 91 over you. Yes. That you and your entire household will be safe and strong and well. You will be protected uh, and, and you will be provided for too. God is our provider. Amen. Amen. So I want to remind you of just a couple of things. Welcome to our home. This is where Barb and I live. This is our sunroom. And uh, you can see it's pretty sunny. And uh, we have a beautiful view here, I hope that you have a beautiful view this morning as well in your home. I hope you got your family gathered around. Thank and your, you. And your animals. And your animals. That's right. Ours are right next door. Hopefully they won't be making a lot no, of noise. No, they're in our house. Well, our yes, house. around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you for being faithful with your tithes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, this was the time when Israel got in trouble. Uh, we read about it in Malachi 3 where they, because they were struggling and things weren't going well and they were rebuilding and, and you know, life was tough that they stopped tithing and they got in a lot of trouble because of that. So don't, you know, we don't want you to be in a position where you're having natural things come at you and not being fully protected. So thank you again for blessing the church and blessing God and his kingdom uh, by continuing to tithe. Remember, you can mail in your, your tithe to 731 Windermere Drive, 37043 Faith Outreach Church. Or you can go on to faithoutreachnorth.org, and we have a place there. If you just click on it, it'll take you to Faith Outreach, is a site where you can give there electronically. All right. Okay. Now, right beside me is my partner, best friend, and, I, and the best minister a, a guy could ever have, PB, who's going to bring a little jelly for you this morning. Amen. I need your chair, Pastor. See, if we... Uh worked for ABC, well, we'd have two uh, computers and a switcher, and I wouldn't have to switch chairs, but we work for God and we share the same chair. Amen. All right. So good morning, everybody. Good morning, church. So I need you to just say that to somebody sitting next to you. Maybe it's an animal on your lap or a child or your spouse or a significant other, or maybe you have fewer than 10 people in your house in there in chairs all over the house just scream good morning everybody good morning church happy palm sunday of course we all wish that we were together but we are together in spirit there's nothing that can keep us apart in our spirits so what i want to do i have been so blessed this week uh not only because i was able to figure out zoom if anybody knows what i'm talking about zoom is a way of connecting to groups to people and I don't, I'm not real good at technology, but David helped me get this Zoom thing working. And I connected to one of my classes and I had the best time talking to my kids. I didn't realize how much I was missing people because I, my house is so full. I have six fur babies and David. And so I didn't realize how I was missing them so much, but I miss those little munchkins and they made my life really happy this week. Another thing that made me really, really happy this week is I was in touch electronically with some women in the church and their testimonies blessed me so much. I'm not gonna give you their names, but you know them and I've been ministering to them a long time and it is from those testimonies that I wanna bring you a little bit of wisdom today. One woman said to me that she was encountering worship in a new way since being shut in. She and her children and her whole family. And as she was worshiping, the Lord impressed upon her the need to build an altar in her home. And she thought, I, how do I build an altar? I can't go out and get anything and I don't know how to construct anything. And then suddenly she remembered the time that um, God had me, Pastor Dave and I bought rocks. I don't know if you remember that or if you were here, but the Lord prompted us to buy lava rocks and bring them to the church and told everybody to collect those rocks on their way out of the church and take them home. 
so that they could build altars of sacrifice in their homes. Well, this young woman did that. And the, she said the rocks had been in her house ever since that moment and she'd never thought of them again. So this week when God said, build me an altar, she went over and she picked up those rocks. She said, Pastor Barbara told me to have these rocks. So she picked up the rocks and she started an altar by her fireplace. So she has begun to worship at the altar that she has constructed and is continuing to build in her house, not only in her house, but in her heart. So in this period, in this Holy Week, in this period of sacrifice and remembering what the Lord did for us and how powerful, powerful his resurrection as we are celebrating, she is now going to continue to build her altar. So I make that challenge to you all too. What is God asking you to do? And the other thing I, I want to share with you is about a year and a half ago, I had a word for one of our women and uh, it wasn't that I, I was in fellowship and in, in relationship with this woman. I, it wasn't a stranger. And I had, but I had a word from her about uh, something and someone she was going to encounter that would be significant in her life. I, I gave the word and, and those of you who can move or have tried to move or are blessed to move in the gift of prophecy, you know that the prophet is only as good as the word. I, Pastor Dave and I, when we give words, we don't do it lightly. And we trust that we're hearing God's voice and not our own. And time will tell. Because if the, if the prophetic word comes true, then indeed we did hear his voice. So you wanna be careful in giving and in receiving words of prophecy. But this one I felt pretty sure about. It came out of my mouth before I even knew. I was fairly certain that it was God. So I gave it to this woman and just this week, that word came to pass. And there were things along the way that, that God was instructing her to do uh, so that he could bless her with the answer to her, to her prayer. So I, I'm, I was struck when I was thinking about you all, about how both of these testimonies included doing something being obedient to do something that God had instructed you to do. Both of these women did something so that he could then fulfill the word he had for them. I was thinking last week when I was uh, talking to Michael from the church, I said, Michael, make everybody sit down. Tell everybody, sit, 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 sit. And of course, Pastor Dave and I were the only ones in the church and Brian and Kenneth and, and Carla. Uh, but, you know, nobody saw Michael do that. But later in the week, Debbie told us that Michael had a response when I said, Michael, do that. And you know what that means? Michael and both of these women, just this week, I was reminded of how obedient they were Nobody saw them do what, what God was asking them to do. It was between them and God, and God was able to bless them because of obedience. We can't see you. We are trusting that you're watching us and responding to us and that the Spirit of God has, is hovering all around you, that the angels are taking care of you. But we do have a time, we are in a season, when God is asking us to do certain things. We need to obey him. We need to obey the leaders that have been put over us because he has given them charge over us. We're responsible to them, they're responsible to God. So in this season where it requires great sacrifice on our parts, remember the 91st Psalm. Remember the charge that God gave us on Wednesday night to give away that Psalm, to reach out and give it to somebody so that they can be blessed and they can understand what it means to dwell in the shelter of the Almighty. I love you guys so much. I hope that's more than jam. I hope that's a great big bunch of preserves piled on your biscuit this morning. I love you and I can't wait to see you. Please pray for us. We really, really covet your prayers. I love you. Okay, you need to get up now. Oh, I have to get up. <laughs> She was waiting for something remarkable to happen, and it, <laughs> and it was and it was her getting up. Amen. Well, that I love how creative and how inventive and uh, 
how faithful God is. Amen. All right. So now you know what comes next. Hope you got your Bible right there. Here's mine. I hope you um, have it. Okay. Everybody grab your Bible. You know exactly what we're going to do. You don't have to stand up. Michael, you don't have to stand up. It's okay. All right. If you'll repeat after me, this is my Bible. It is my sword. It is the living word of God. It guides me into all truth. If I do what it says, I will be an overcomer. If I do what it says, I will walk in spiritual authority. If I do what it says, I will have an abundant life right now, today. Holy Spirit, help me always do what the Word of God says. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I hope you're ready to dig into the Word and uh, see what God has for us this morning. It's a beautiful day. This is a day that the Lord has made, and it is ours to rejoice in it. Amen. So I have, of course, uh, been observing everything that's going on around us, and it's impossible not to see what's going on and to read what's going on and to hear and, and even to have some conversation with people as we talk about the events all around us. And one of the sort of themes of this last week as I saw it was everybody is trying to tell us or imply that there are certain things we need to know. And so the whole phrase has been what we need to know as if we really could know everything. We've never been here before. None of us have ever experienced anything quite like this. We've had, we've had pandemics before. We've actually had it flu in, you know, the, uh, the, the flu season we've had, we've had, we had H1N1. We, we had, we've had things like this, but we've never had the media storm and uh, the, the fear. We've never had quite like this. We've never had almost every company corporation in America shut down. We've never had every restaurant in America shut down. We've never had these kinds of experiences before. So we've never had the unemployment. We've never had the, the, the isolation and the confusion and the fear, quite frankly. We've never had any of that before. So now people are saying to us all over the television, especially what we need to know. Every program is what you need to know. Well, the truth is no one really knows. We've never been here before. We have the basic facts, which is it has a certain, there's a certain cause, there's a certain uh, time frame in which one can become susceptible to it. There are certain precautions we can take, but beyond that, we don't really know. And so the world is trying to, to, to occupy our brains and our thoughts, and, and, and they're not really doing a good job in terms of giving us more information. They're actually repeating the same thing over and over and over again. And I don't know what value that really has. We've heard everything that there is to be said really about this virus. I mean, what we're getting now is statistics day after day after day. And I caution you to be very careful about watching that and drinking that in. It's a little bit like watching the stock market go up and down and up and down and up and down. We will come out of this. We will be fine. It'll be a little crazy for a little while, but we will come out of this. So, in my preparation, I've been thinking and meditating and praying, and, and I think God is leading me in this direction. It's more about knowing who we are right in this moment than what this thing is, or we can clearly see what's going on, but what are we and who, we, who are we in this moment? So we don't think about assessment. We don't think about self-evaluation much, and we really don't have the time to do it, but we do have that time now. And so really my, the thing that the Lord has been saying to me over and over and over again is that this is a time when we need to spend a little, more, we have the time, so let's spend some time with ourselves. Now, it's interesting, isn't it, that I began using Psalms 4610, be still and know that I am God, long before this pandemic started. I started two or three weeks, I think, before it even was on, was a topic. But God was preparing me and preparing you for this particular time. And that's something Barbara was just talking about that, how God has done things that are now being played out. And, and that's who God is. God is always preparing us for the next thing. And if we pay attention to it, 
we will uh, be ahead of the curve. And that's really what God wants for us as believers. That's how he protects us. So be still and know that I am God. So today I want to look at that knowing aspect again. Knowing God, the Bible says, starts with fearing God, not the circumstances. We don't get to know God more by being afraid of what's going on around us. Just the opposite will happen. We'll we'll lose our place with God. We'll, we'll forget really who he is when we are in fear. That's what happened to the Israelites. Every time they got into some crazy situation, they forgot. And then it would come back to them and they would call out to God. But the Bible says that, that fear is the beginning of knowing or of knowledge or of wisdom. So this having a healthy respect for God, being awed, awed by all that he is and all that we know he can do. See, part of what's going on right now is we have to reflect on what has God done in our lives? Who has he been in our lives? And we have to hold on to that. That's precious information to us right now. So clearly, the more we know him, the more all we become. That is certainly my story. In 1986, when I came back to the Lord, I knew very little about him. I did not know him, certainly not the way I know him now. So over those years from 1986 until now, I have seriously tried to get to know God better. And the more I know about him, the more awed I am. But of course, that takes time. You don't get to have that kind of knowledge of God in just a day or two. It is a, it, it is a long journey. It's a long experiential journey. There are things that happen. There's a relationship. There's a development, as in any relationship. But I know God more now, better now, than I ever have in my whole life, certainly more than I did in 1986. So let's look at a couple of scriptures. Let's go over to Exodus, Exodus 33 and verse 13. So this is Moses, and um, Moses prayed this particular prayer when he was being stretched like crazy. I mean, none of us can imagine what it would be like to lead two million or so people through the wilderness to take care of their daily needs. To, their, you know, how impossible is that? Well, without God, of course, no one would have been able to do that. But Moses was being stretched as much as any of us can imagine being stretched. And he prayed this prayer. He said, if you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. So he says two things there. He says, one, I want to please you. That's really, really important. Pleasing God means we're not pleasing ourselves and we're not pleasing man. So we're making a choice there, a conscious choice to please God, putting him first. That's important during this particular time. Where, what's our focus in terms of that? Second, he says, teach me. So being open to being teachable, you've heard me say before that the word teachable and the word humble in the Greek New Testament are come from the same root or core word. He says, teach me your ways so I may know you. So being taught by God is a way that we get to know him. And then he said, and that I might continue to find favor with you. See, God blesses us. That's what he loves to do. And the more we know him, really, the more blessings can come to us because the more we know him, the more we want to know about him, the more awed we are. And it becomes one of those things where it, it, it all fits together like an incredible, beautiful puzzle. So finding favor with God is part of who we are. We are allowed to seek it. And Moses right there says, let me continue to have it. So even as Moses was being stretched, he felt God's favor on him. Now, the word no in that particular sentence is exactly the same word where it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife. It's a Hebrew word called yada, Y-A-D-A. And that word has to do with physical intimacy. Adam knew Eve. It's the same word that Moses was using. He was saying, God, I want to know you in a way that is so personal and so deep and so just between the two of us. I want it to be that intimate because I know that if I have that kind of relationship with you, I'll be changed. 
sharing with you and knowing you and having you know me in that way will change who I am. And clearly, intimacy does change people. When people know each other intimately in ways that no one else knows us. You know, Barbara knows me in a way that no one else on the whole earth knows me. Thank God. Praise God. And, and so we have this intimate relationship in our spirit and in our soul and on our physical bodies. And in those ways, we know each other like no one else knows us. And it's so deeply personal and it shapes us. So knowing God can only happen through desire and purpose. And as Moses discovered and certainly was discovered in this moment by trials, we don't often think of trials in terms of intimacy or in terms of knowing but we're not going to get through this life without trials and the trials are meant by god according to romans 3 5 those trials are meant to shape us and draw us nearer to god we're supposed to come out of trials stronger and closer to god than we've ever been before well what a, what an incredible time we have right here because we are all in trials I don't know whether you're having financial issues right now. I don't know if you are unemployed suddenly right now. I don't know if you are afraid right now. All of these things, this is what we see going on, certainly in our world. And in this moment, in this trial, it is God's absolute desire and intention and his purpose that we come through this and that we come out of it stronger than we've ever been ever before. I really believe that. If we use this time efficiently and, 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 and carefully and, and purposefully, we can be stronger than we've ever been. We will not regret this moment because it will give us something that we wouldn't have had if this moment had ha hadn't happened. Barb and I often talk about the missteps that we both made, but I in particular, years and years and years and years ago, that thing shaped me. It created me. It made us who we are today. And we could not have the knowledge that we have if we hadn't had those very uh, incredible, seemingly in the moment, horrendous trials. But those trials shaped us. They made us to be who we are. All right. In Jeremiah 29, 13, you're familiar with this verse. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Well, isn't it true that in trial, in this moment right now, perhaps you're seeing for yourself, this is when we seek God the hardest. <laughs> this is when we pay a little more attention or a lot more attention, I hope, to God or to seeking God. We are not fooling around right now. This is so serious. It's serious for everyone. Not unto death for us. The, I really believe the Bible says that we can claim and proclaim protection. Absolutely, 100% across the board. I know, I know, I know what other people are saying, but I'm telling you, you can claim that. But this is a time when, because there is trial, we're, we're trying a little harder to get close to God. And there's nothing wrong with that. God is totally cool with that. Because he says that if we do it, we will find him. Especially if we do it with all of our hearts. Now, the enemy wants us to seek help from everyone else except God or every place except from God. This isn't going to work. Clearly, granted, there are lots of agencies and the government and perhaps people in the community who are trying to help us and who are trying to do things that are helpful. But no one on this planet is going to be able to help you the way God can help you. This is a moment where God is your provider. He is your everything. And so really focusing on that is very, very important. And you can do that and it will make a huge difference. So what is our purpose in this moment? You know, we, we all are looking for purposes in life. And in this moment, in this particular moment, what is it that we need to be focusing on what are we to do and who are we and what will what will shape us in this moment? Well, I think discovering where we are in our process of knowing God is very, very important. Again, it is a self-evaluation. It is self-assessment. 
It is doing some introspection. It is doing some meditating. It is really taking a look. We don't have a time. We don't have time to do this. We don't have to, you know, during during a, a normal whatever that is and will be. We're too busy. Life is just coming at us so fast. We don't have time to do what we're able to do during this time. So I think there are three levels of knowing God. They're obvious. Number one is intellectually. We can know God in our head. We know what we've heard uh, or what we've read. You listen to me and to Pastor Barbara and to others uh, speak about God, preach about God, instruct about God, teach about God. You go online yourself or you go into books or you go into your Bible and you read and you have an intellectual knowing of God. But is that enough for this moment? And that's what I'm really asking you to ask yourself. You have a head knowledge of God. Clearly you do. But is that going to be enough to get you through this particular time period? Is it going to be enough to be intellectually in relationship with God, to know him or to know about him? I don't think so. I, I think in this moment, God is clearly showing us that we need to go to another level. Well, the second level is emotional. Our feelings shape how important we make a person in our lives. It shapes how much time, for example, that we allow that person to be in our lives or how much time we give them. And that's, that's great. You know, Barbara and I love each other and we've been married now almost 52 years. And obviously we know each other very, very well and we still love each other and want to be. So we are emotionally really tied together. And it's true that I give, I will give Barbara time when I give, when I don't have time or when I'm not going to give time to other people, I'm going to give it to Barbara first. Absolutely. So in, in that place, in that emotional knowing, it's good that we give God time. But the question is, how will we use the time that we give him? You know, Barbara and I, again, we've been together for almost 52 years. We are certainly together as you are together in your home. Uh, um, unable to get out really. And so, you know, sometimes when people who are used to being away from each other during the day or day and night, and then they come and they're together 24 seven, it can be very interesting, right? Because now you're in each other's ways and you know, you're in the, you're in the kitchen and they're in the kitchen or you're used to doing this, the thing this way. And then they come in and they want to do it this way. And so, you know, everything gets a little crazy, you know? So, but in that moment, we now, because that's the moment that we have, we have to figure out how to make this work, right? You know, so, and it isn't enough that we are in the same house together. It's not enough that we're, you know, in the same room together. We need to be connecting. We need to be sharing. We need to be talking. We need to be, I mean, Barbara and I are having conversations. Now, in all honesty, at least from my perspective, I think we've had pretty good conversations for, for many, many years now, because it's something that, that I've tried to work on having conversation and, uh, but we've had more conversation and we've had some very interesting discussions about life, about certainly about God, about ourselves and our relationship. And it's really been healthy. It's really been good. It's really been fun actually. And we've had some interesting afternoons when we just sit around and talk. Oh my gosh talk. Can you imagine the two of us or the two of you, you know, sitting around or your family sitting around talking, but that's what we're supposed to do. So that's a good start, that emotional connection, but there's a third connection and that is the spiritual. Isn't that obvious? So this is what we need to choose and to find. See, not all of us know, for example, in our own relationships with other people, do you know how to be spiritually intimate with other people? If you are there with your spouse or you're there with your family, do you know how to be spiritually intimate with them where you are sharing so, so deeply and in a, in a way that is so connected and so honest and so open that it is intimate, that you're revealing things and sharing things that that maybe you've never shared with anyone before? I mean, are you having conversations with your family or with people who are around you 
that you've never had before. I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And so to be on the spiritual level with God, especially during this time, it means knowing him in a way that transcends understanding. Well, that's the definition of peace, isn't it, according to the Bible? To know God in a way that transcends understanding. And because of that, we will have peace. When you are in a spiritual relationship with God, you're going to have peace. You're going to have peace. You're not going to spend your day in an anxious way. You're not going to spend your day worrying. People who have a good, strong, spiritually intimate relationship with God are not people who are freaking out. Absolutely not. Now, they have, may have moments of fleeting things where their, their brain gets in the way and they get, you know, turned around a little bit as we could have, uh, you know, in this moment. But they're not going to spend a lot of time totally, you know, whacked out. This is not how it's going to be. All right. So what do we really need to know? That's the question everybody's asking right now. What do we, what do you really need to know during this pandemic What's really important? What's really going to make a difference now, during this time and afterwards? What will shape you going forward? So let me give you a few of those things. Number one, God directs our paths. We're still in God's plan. No matter what's going on, no matter how crazy it seems, no matter how weird it seems, no matter how out of control we feel, God is still directing our paths. He still has you in mind. He still has you in his plan. You've not gotten lost. And this is very important. When the whole world is crazy and there's chaos everywhere, it's good to know that you are right where you need to be. God still has a plan for your life and you are still in it regardless of what's going on in the world or regardless of what's going on right this moment specifically in your life you're still in god's plan number two god's ways are higher than our ways how many times have we read that well in a moment like this it's important to understand that we don't have the big picture can't have the big picture but god does god saw this pandemic coming he saw everything that's going on in our country in our world he saw all of the panic he saw the sickness itself. He saw the loss of life. He saw all of it. He saw the fear, but God knew what he had in mind to do during this and where he's taking us afterwards. So God has the big picture. He knows where we're going. If there is a plan and there is, if you're in the plan and you are, he knows where he's taking you right now. So God's ways are higher. We don't have the big picture. And this is always a problem with us because we want the big picture. Well, you can't have it. You don't know how this is going to turn out. But because you are a child of God, God's promises says it will turn out well with you and your soul. Number three, God gives us good things. That's what the Bible tells us. God is a good God. He can't give us anything but good, which means are we choosing to live in the good of this moment? You know, one of the things that we're not very good at is living in the present moment, in right now. Not in yesterday, not in tomorrow, but in right now. Is your choice, your daily choice, to find the good, seek the good, be aware of the good, and then live in the good of that moment. I've said to you before, you, you can't control what's going on in Asia. You can't control what's going on in other parts of the world. You, you have no way of controlling that. You can't control what's going on in the rest of the city. You can't control really what's going on in your neighborhood, but you can control yourself. And to some measure, you can help sort of shape things in your family unit if there are more than one of you there. Are you choosing to live in the good? Look for the good. Find the good in this moment. Right now, I'm sitting in a, in a sunlit room looking out and there are birds flying all around. This room is surrounded by windows on every side. And I can see nature and I can see the sunshine and I can see the green. There's a lot of my my backyard is just blossoming right now. 
I, I've been going out, Barbara and I have been going out on our deck and just sitting and enjoying the peace of the moment. And, and look, there's chaos going on. You know, Central Park is full of tents right now, filled with people who are afraid, who are anxious, who are being tended to physically. It's a little chaotic probably right there. That's not happening on my back deck. That's not happening in my backyard. Barbara and I, though we pray for those people and we are conscious of those people, when we're sitting on our back deck, we're taking advantage of that moment and we're really enjoying the time. We're choosing to live in the good that God has provided in every moment. Number four, God is the one who gives us peace. It's not going to come any other way, my friends. It, it, it can't come from any other way. This is not a time when peace is going to come from the world. It's only going to come from God. Substantial peace, long-lasting peace, peace that will really penetrate your soul, that will cause you to sleep well at night. It's not going to come from another source. And it's important. This is a, again, there are many of these points that I'm going to give you this morning. These are reminders. God is reminding you that he is the God of peace. He's reminding you of that. And, and therefore wants you to remember that and to choose him in the midst of this. Number five, God's not done. God's not done. Let him finish before you judge what's going on. Stop trying to write the ending. You know, you've heard us say that many times, but stop judging what's going on. You don't know everything. We can't know everything. We can't know, we can't know what tomorrow will bring. And we need to stop imagining how many numbers, the numbers are larger, 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 larger. Well, that may be the case for a while. But for you and your house, that is not going to be the case. Let God finish what he's doing on the earth in your life. Let God finish what he's doing with you today, right now. And take advantage of that and stop judging. Number six, God knows the way. He knows the way. He is, as we sing sometimes in that song, he's the way maker. I can't tell you the number of times that Barbara and I have prayed, Lord, make a way where there seems to be no way. Over the years, that has been our baseline prayer. Lord, we believe you'll make a way where there seems to be no way. Well, in this moment, there seems to be no way. How are we ever going to figure out how to get out of this? Well, we can't. It's impossible for us to figure it out. But God is making a way right now. He's making a way out of this. That's what his word says. That's why when you read in Psalms 23, you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's why you read in other Psalms where you will walk through the flood, you will walk through the fire. He's making a way for you to get to the other side right now. It's that ram in the thicket. You can't see it. You can't see everything that's going on. God is making a way for you right now. Number seven, God strengthens us. God is our strength. God is a strong tower and we run into him and we are safe. That's what the word says. You can't find the strength that you need in yourself right now. It's not going to be possible. That strength can only come from God. You can't find it in yourself. And as much as our government is trying and as much as I think they're doing as good a job as anyone could possibly do, it's not the government that will get, bring you strength. It is God himself. God is our source of strength, our only source of strength right now. He gives us the ability. He's the rock. He will give us the ability not just to hang on, but to endure and to live through this. Number eight, we walk by faith. Well, isn't that interesting? We walk by faith. This is an important reminder. This pandemic, this moment, everything we're going through is an important reminder of how we are called to live. You are called to live by faith. You're called to that. That's what you signed on to when you said yes to, to Jesus Christ. You said, Lord, I'm going to live my life by faith now. I'm not going to live by what I see. I'm not going to live by my circumstances. I'm going to live by faith in you. Jesus said when he was talking to his disciples, have faith in God. 
if you say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and, and you do not doubt in your mind, in your heart, and you believe that it will happen, it will be done. He said, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. God is that kind of God. We walk by faith and not by sight. Number nine, there's a purpose for this moment in time. There's a purpose for this moment in time. God does nothing and will allow nothing unless there is a purpose behind it. Are you looking for it? Are you looking for that purpose in, in this moment? Or are you just spinning around in a circle? Ah. No, this isn't the time to do that. This isn't the time to be overwhelmed. This is a time to find within yourself, what is my purpose? What is God's purpose in this moment? And then to really embrace that, to find it, to know it, and then to live it. And then number 10, God meets all our need. He meets all of our needs. God is our provider. I don't know of anything that is more important for us to know individually as believers that God is our provider. When I was very, very young in the Lord, when, when Barbara and I were very, very young in the Lord, the, one of the first lessons he gave us it was so important that we know this. He showed us that he would provide for us no matter what. I'm telling you, whatever your situation is right now, whatever your circumstance is, whether it's a financial, whether it's physical, whether you are in a place where you just don't know where or how you're going to make it into tomorrow. I'm telling you, God is your provider. He is your provider. And if you believe that and pray that and proclaim that over yourself, he will prove himself faithful. He will. That's who our God is. Now, I want you to listen to this. This difficult time is giving us an opportunity to make discoveries we might never have taken the time to find. We have an opportunity here You've heard me say this before. I'll probably keep saying this. We may never have another opportunity in like this to discover some things about God, especially about ourselves. Very, very good about others in our lives. This is so important. Take the time. You'll never have this moment again. Use it to your full advantage. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do this week. I'm going to give you some homework. This is, this is how I'm going to do it. You know, I can't see you and, and I'm not with you. So, so I want to give you things uh, that will help you. Uh, Often when I'm in session, you know, in my office, I'll, I'll give people homework, things to do that they're supposed to do before I see them again. So here's something I want you to do. I want you to commit to before next week. And I want you to keep it up. And I want you to just do it this next week. I want you to keep doing it. Number one, every day, Make time, make time, take the time, you have it now, to sit down and think about what is important to you. What is important to you in your life? Make a list, write it down, put it on a, on a, a piece of paper so that you can see it, see it and read it back. Uh, take the time to think about what is important to you right now, in this moment. What's the most important thing? Number two, as you sit and think, Add God into the conversation. Don't make it just about you. Include God into this time of meditation, this time of thinking. And then, number three, be quiet. Are you listening? Be quiet. Number two, be open. Really be open. And number three, be receptive. Receive from the Lord in that moment. And then number four, Pray a prayer of gratitude as you finish. Be thankful. Let God hear your thanks before you finish. Five, take that attitude. Take the attitude that you had or that you found in that quiet moment into the rest of your day. In other words, use what you get from that moment in the rest of your day. Make it count. Make it part of. 
And if you do that every single day, you're going to make some huge changes in your life. You're going to make some huge changes in how you operate. You're going to make some huge changes in how you are in relationship and what's coming out, out of you. It will be a dramatic change. And then finally, number six, check on someone to see how they're doing. Check on someone this week. And then next week, check on someone, see how they're doing, and encourage them. As we encourage others, we will be encouraged. That's how it works. Minister to someone else this week. Reach out to someone. You can text them. You can call them. You can email them. There's lots of ways. You know, you, you can Skype with people. You can Zoom. Borb has learned how to Zoom this week. There's lots of ways that you can get in touch with people. Reach out to someone this week and see how they're doing. It'll be a big deal to them to know that someone cares. We have recently been getting lots of phone calls from people all around the country. And we are so thankful that people are thinking about us and, and praying for us and, and want to know how we're doing. It's a big deal. It really makes us feel good. And then encourage that person. Now listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians 1, 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is Paul. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. They went through quite a bit. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. Here we are. We thought we would never live through it, he says. In fact, we expected to die. I've been hearing this phrase. There are predictions out there on the numbers of how many people will die. I think we need to stop that. And and, and because I think what's happening is people are, are, are now afraid that if they contract this virus, that they will die. And so if they do get it and they go into the hospital, then they expect to die. We need to stop thinking that way. We need to stop that. That's not going to help us. In fact, it's going to be counterproductive. And quite frankly, if that's what you think when you go into the hospital, you may die. So we need to stop that kind of thinking. But Paul says we expect it to die. He said, but as a result, listen to this, but as a result of this pandemic, as a result of everything we went through, he says, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Wow. As a result of everything that happened, they learned something very, very, very important. They learned to stop relying on themselves, on other people. And they learned to rely, he says, only on God who raises the dead. This is so important for us. Okay, I'm going to repeat something. Everything God does or allows has a purpose. That means even in this pandemic, even this pandemic has a purpose. Now, the enemy has one purpose for it, and that's to destroy us and to keep us in fear and to keep us so anxious that, that we, we live in dread. That's the enemy's. What is it then? Why did God even allow this to prove to us just how big he is. I believe that. I believe that in this moment, God wants to show himself strong, wants to show the nation, wants to show the nations how strong he is and who he is. So what do we need to know? That's the question. I started out there, everybody saying, what do you need to know? What do we need to know? What do you need to know? Well, here's what we need to know. God is I am. That's what we need to know. In every situation, God is I am. God is there for you, regardless of what you are going through this morning. And some of you may be going through some hard times and you may be a, a, a little afraid. But I'm telling you that God is, I am in that circumstance, in that situation, and you do not need to be afraid. Let him have his way in your life in this moment. Let him have his way in your life in this moment every day. Let him have his way in your life during this pandemic. Let's not just break the yoke of this burden. And that's really what we're required to do. Turn this burden over to the Lord. Let's overcome it. Let's be overcomers. 
That's what we are to do in this moment. All right, PBJ is going to come in and she's going to help me close and we're going to pray and we're going to believe with you and we're going to stand with you and we're going to watch God and hear. We're going to hear the testimonies from you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for being with all who are listening to us right this second. Your hand is so strong in their lives, I know. And you are working miracles. You're creating testimonies right this second in their lives. You're protecting them. You're providing for them. You're giving them grace. You're, you're giving them hope. You are encouraging them. You are the lifter of their head. And Father, I thank you that it is your love that will prevail in all of this. And they will come out of this stronger and better than they have ever been in their lives. And they will know you better than ever before. And that will be a good thing. That is your desire. So, Father, we love, 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 love our church. We love the families. We love every individual. We thank you so much. They're so precious to us. Thank you for putting us together on this earth, even for such a time as this. And we lift them up. And we shout gratitude and thanks for all that you're doing and all that we will hear that you're doing. And we give you thanks and give you glory and give you honor and give you all power and praise in this moment. In Jesus name. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. God bless you all. We're family. You're home.